The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome, Full Stature Ministries, Kingdom Life Church. I know that everybody is doing their homework and they're seeking the fear of the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord initiative, what's it require? It requires effort and dedication. But uh, today, I want to cover... Uh, something that was uh, kind of stirred up a little bit Tuesday in me uh, but uh, I want to I want to cover the cave of Adullam. lessons that we can learn from the cave of Adullam. how many of you know what the cave of Adullam is that's where David fled to the cave all right and he wrote a psalm uh, in that fleeting moment to the cave and uh, you could tell what the condition of his spiritual life was at that point in time by his psalms. You know, you can tell a lot by, by the psalms that David writes, what's going on, all right? So uh, here's, here's the two uh, contexts that we're going to have. First of all, 1 Samuel chapter 22 uh, covers the cave of Adullam. And I'm going to read it to you. David, therefore, departed from there. He's been running from Saul. He departed from there and escaped, escaped. So you know he was being <laughs> pursued. He escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard of it, they went down to him. And everyone who was in distress, in debt, and discontent. In debt, in distress, and discontent. Now, i got to throw what the message says. The message said, losers, vagrants, and misfits. <laughs> a pretty strong language. But, you know, quite frankly, to me, it doesn't matter because God didn't make anybody that way. And there's gold in everybody. Redemption is the name of the game, and it doesn't change. So these can be based on circumstances in their life, based on failures, based on who knows what. Uh, caused it, but God didn't make them that way. And the beautiful thing about the cave of Adullam, out of that cave, and that's what I want to get into, but we got to learn the lessons in the cave, because out of that cave came David's mighty men. So much for misfits, losers, people in distress, in debt, and discontent. It's a question of what you and God do together that determines the outcome, doesn't it? So, 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2, that's going to be the context of the cave, so you can always do more research on the cave of Adullam. But I want to read to you Psalm 142, which was written during that time. All right? This is David in the cave. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. My voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit is overwhelmed within me, then you knew, you knew my path in the way in which I should walk. They have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see. There's nobody here for me who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. You ever talk like that? I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I brought, I'm being brought low. Deliver me from the persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I might praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. He was in a hard place. Okay? And... Uh, There's some lessons that we can learn here, and I think it's real important that we, that we see some of these things, because obviously something wonderful happened in that cave, in the presence of God, for them to come out mighty men of valor, all right? And not that David had, didn't have a little bit of a history of victory either. You know, in 1 Samuel 22, 
this was quite a season in David's life. You know, there's, there's a time for everything under the sun. There's times when things go really well, and then there's seasons. All right? It was like that Time Machine movie. He says, skip 2020 if you go back in time. <laughs> All right? <laughs> All right. There's seasons, right? All right. And I believe there's a lot of people that are dealing with cave issues, and we, we need to learn some of the lessons. What, there's obviously hope for misfits discontent, in distress, and you may not feel like you fit that, but anything apart from a glorious victory in Jesus as sons and daughters, you fall short. So let's, let's deal with some of these things. We're going to be in training in the cave, all right? Um, it's a period of time when he hides in caves and dens. And quite frankly, if you read that psalm, it was all about me. That's what David said. Me, 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 all right? I know none of you have ever done that, but it's a period of time where he hides in caves. He hides from Saul, who's seeking to kill him. Uh, he's hunted and hounded, running from Saul. It's a time when he describes it like this. Uh, here's the way he describes it <clears throat> uh, in 1 Samuel 26. I'm hunted like a partridge. Okay, uh, Psalm 102. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness which is the image of loneliness and distress. So he's hunted, he's giving imagery of being lonely and distressed. Um, that's the implication of pelican in the wilderness. Uh, a net has been prepared for me. Uh, there's an awareness that he's always looking, that they're looking to trap him. They want to trap him somehow. So David therefore departed, escaped to the cave of Adullam. And... Uh, Really what I saw is the brokenhearted need to get healed. But here's the good thing. It said those people that came to David in the cave, at least they did something. I'm going to repeat that. At least they got up and did something. They were looking for a solution because you can wallow in it uh, and you can stay there forever. Um, uh, one of the keys that I want you to remember through this message, too, is that there's something about being knocked down, but there's something about getting back up that can determine the outcome. All right? There's two times uh, in the scripture that you're mentioned about David going to a cave. Adullam, and we see the condition of David at the time, and En Gedi. And Jennifer and I, when we were in Israel, we, uh, they had us tie in a message based on where we were preaching. And Jennifer and I preached at En Gedi. And that's the place where David and his mighty men, a little different than Adullam, in debt, in distress, discontent, misfits, <laughs> losers. Okay, now he's with the mighty men and he's in a cave. And uh, it's a whole lot different story there because um, En Gedi, uh, it's where he cut off the part of uh, Saul's robe but didn't harm him. I mean, he was moving in such uh, honor that he was not only honoring God, he was honoring even even the enemy. And and it was like, you know, he's still king. So, and Gedi, in 1 Samuel, uh, I think that's 24, 1 Samuel 24, we see a whole different cave experience. And uh, we taught at En Gedi on how David um, encouraged himself in the Lord. And then we just, how do you encourage yourself in the Lord? All right. And we kind of did that. And I'm not going to get into that. But anyway, those are those two times. But at Adullam, David is alone when he writes. When he writes that psalm, he's still alone. Now, his, his father and people came later. But <clears throat> keep in mind, he's got a background here. This is not some kind of a, David was not some kind of an inexperienced person here and was going through that kind of a, a torment and mess. Uh, he was alone. But there was a time where he was anointed as Saul's successor. There was a time when he slayed a lion and a bear and a giant. There was a time when he was honored for slaying 10,000. David kills his ten thousands, you know. Um, but right now, he's huddled in a cave. Question is, have you ever been there? You ever been huddled in a cave? 
I think we need to learn some lessons. What do we do when you're huddled in the cave? Right? So David flees. He flees from Samuel to Rama. He, from Nob, he flees to get food. He flees from Ach- Achish for protection. Now he's 16 miles south of Jerusalem in a cave under the mountains of Judah in the valley between Philistia, hiding in a limestone cave called Adullam. I mean, he was even, we covered this, I think, last in the last message, he was even hiding, he feigned insanity to survive in the enemy's camp. I mean, run, 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 run. He, he's had his share of running. But the lesson we need to learn from from the cave of Adullam, God didn't go anywhere. God doesn't leave you or forsake you, does he? Uh, this is the transition. This is what David is discovering, that as he prays and seeks God in the cave, there's a transformation somewhere. And I, I have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit's saying. The transformation is going from the fear of man to the fear of the Lord. And remember, the fear of the Lord is not fear. The fear of the Lord is honor, respect, awe. We've said this before. We've heard people say, backslidden Christians, say, when did you stop loving Jesus? Oh, I never stopped loving Jesus. I just no longer feared disobeying. I no longer had the respect or the honor, nor was I giving God what he deserved. Oh, but I still love Jesus. Well, you know what? That's not enough. You're going to have to show it by your actions. It's got to be not lip service, but demonstration. <clears throat> so David discovers, the cra- uh, hey, you know what? The, the cave makes a great play- prayer closet. <laughs> you know, if really, uh, I know there's people in hard places right now that are hearing this message. And this is really what, it, we're in a season of discipleship. So you really need to know, what do I do in the cave? Because you can wallow in it forever and it just gets worse. But the caves can make a great prayer closet. The caves, uh, even in the solitude, which is not healthy, they that isolate themselves seek their own and not the wisdom of others. And that's a danger. But nevertheless, if you're going to, you're going to say, I'm isolated, he didn't have any choice. I'm here, I'm alone, I ran, I'm in the cave. All right. At least use that isolation for the purpose of of devotion. You better get a hold of God. You're alone. God's there. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. God's in that cave. You can't be separated from the love of God. Go to that love of God while you're in the cave. Are you going to something or are you running from something? Big difference. So. Uh, we, really, most of us need to learn that it's okay to be downcast as long as you admit it. You can't quit it unless you admit it. <laughs> right? uh, but it's okay. But you must learn. We use the term walk it out. And I still think a lot of people don't know what we're talking about. But walking it out means it's, not, it's one thing to get a revelation. It's another thing to, to act on it, to live it out until it, you own it and it's real. You can have all the right answers in the world and your life is a mess. Hmm? You can be orthodox and dead <laughs> spiritually. So here was the key uh, that uh, the Lord taught me many years ago, but this is a nice how-to uh, kind of interwoven in the lessons from the cave. Um, in Micah 7, 7 and 8, Micah 7, 7 and 8, there's principles in here of how the, the prophet Micah himself dealt with the world around him. And he said, therefore, therefore, I'm here. Therefore, I'm going to start doing something. What did he say? Therefore, I will look to the Lord. Step one, this is not complicated, but it's a question of, are you? is it me, 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 me in the cave? Or am I going to look to the Lord and I feel, I feel really overwhelmed, but I'm going to look to the Lord. That's the way out. You have to look up. You keep looking down, you just dig, dig a deeper hole, a deeper cave. 
And now it says, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. At least, here we go. Redemption is the name of the game, and he's looking for the God, my God, who is my salvation. My God will hear me. David learned that. God will hear you in the cave. Oh, yeah. No matter where you're at, no matter what your cave is, God can hear you in that cave. And it says, don't rejoice over me, my enemy, because you feel, it feels like he's winning, right? When you're in the cave, when I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Though a righteous man falls seven times, what's he do? Gets back up. Get up. Otherwise, you're down for the count. You know, uh, that was one of the things the Lord showed me and a long time ago when I was in my little pit, my little cave uh, of self-pity. All of a sudden, I saw like a little cartoon in my head where the devil with a pitchfork, horn, tail, the whole bit, you know, just like you would see on a cartoon, and he handed me a shovel, and that shovel had a nameplate on it, self-pity. And he sat and laughed while I was digging my depression. And your depression will become a grave, or a tomb, or a cave. But as long as you are in your self-pity, you are going deeper. There's no solution in going deeper. There's no solution in poor me. At some point, there has to be a transition where you look up, and you return back to God. Otherwise, you just go deeper. You stay focused on the dirt, and that's what you're going to see. But God basically is saying, redemption's the name of the game, and the Spirit of the Lord is saying this right now to Kingdom Life Church, and everyone that's even remotely connected with us, this is the time to be discipling. This is the time that you're going to see the gold in people and be able to pull it out. Now, there's people that you'll never pull the gold out because they don't want to. They, they, they can't be honest enough with their shortcomings. But when they take their shortcomings and present them to the Lord, the gold can come to the surface. So we're in a discipleship season uh, for 2022. And that's a fact. Um, Psalm 34, 1. This is important. Uh, the fact is, at some point, he's going to take you from the prison or the cave to a place of praise. From sackcloth to <laughs> singing. How does that happen? It's, how does that transfer take place? Well, Psalm 34.1 in the Amplified Bible really uh, gives a beautiful clarity to it. In the Amplified, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It's not talking about circumstances or people, is it? It's, it's talking about... I. Uh, I'm going to praise him no matter what. Not for those things, but in the midst of those things. That's part of the way out. There's, a, there's got to be a heart transplant that takes place. There's got to be a supernatural exchange uh, that brings about. How does God do that today? Well, the same way he did it then. You know, regardless of the cave, wherever we are, uh, God will hear your prayer when you change your focus. You can be brought very low but you got to admit it. I will look to the Lord. You know, David is being pursued. He's being abandoned, hemmed in. Uh, he's far from, when you're alone, there's not even anybody to encourage you. And you can be very, very disheartened. His circumstances, relationships, the lack of people at the cave. Um, you had to look up from that cave. You got to look up from your cave. What is your cave anyway? God listens. Hey. But what kind of praying did David do? Understanding what kind of prayer means it's not just lip service. It's got to be how to connect with God in intimacy, in the intimate places, heart to heart, spirit to spirit. It says, David cried unto the Lord in verse 1. Even in the cave, 
David lifted up his voice to God and he cried out to God. That's good. David took his appeal to God in the midst of the darkness. Remember in Micah, what did it say? In my darkness, he will be a light to me. That, that's the transition that has to take place in the heart. David knows prayer works. We know he knows that. But where do you cry? When do you cry out to the Lord? In the car? In the hospital? Kitchen? <laughs> the mall? Prayer closet? In the night? In the church? In the valley? In the grocery store? In the whatever? School? <laughs> Where do you pour out your heart? Apparently, it doesn't much matter what kind of cave you have. You still have equal opportunity to cry out to God with your complaint. Now, that's not the same as venting. Venters never get any better. Venting without believing God is a redeemer. Just like when you forgive someone. You forgive somebody, you quit talking about them. If you're still talking about them, you're just venting. And venting is what killed them in the wilderness. Hmm? Complaining. It's one of the deadly seas. If there's a supernatural transaction, you're done. So David cried out in that cave. He's praying to God, but his focus is for his relationship in God to be greater than his circumstances and the pressures. Psalm 32, 5 in the Amplified, because then in verse 2 it says, I pour out my complaint before him. Now, when you pour out your complaint to other people, you didn't accomplish anything. When you pour out your complaint to God, that means that the pain that's involved with the complaint goes to God, and the reason you know it's been redeemed is there's a supernatural transaction to where it changes to peace. If it doesn't change to peace, you're just a talker. And quite frankly, you're, you're not really re re getting true forgiveness. Uh, it says in Psalm 32, 5 in the Amplified, I acknowledged my sin. I acknowledge again your sin through divine intimate connection. I acknowledged. I acknowledge through divine relationship with Jesus. All right. I acknowledge my sin. To you, God, continually unfolding the past till all was told, then you instantly forgave me my sin. There was a supernatural transaction. You instantly forgave me. How did he know that if he didn't experience it? It's not theoretical. It's supernatural. It needs to be an exchange, a transaction that's real. Now, pour out. The words poured out have great meaning. They mean David kept nothing back. He poured out his bitterness or feeling to God. Pay attention. If you have ears to hear what the Spirit's saying, if you're in the cave right now, the thing to look out for is your bitterness. Until you pour out that bitterness, you will not come out changed. Now, he poured out, uh, David poured out his bitterness or his feelings to God, but was not just having a temper tantrum. He was revealing to himself what he knew had to go. David got it out so that God can take it away. Only God can take away toxic emotions. All you can do is suppress them, make excuses for them. But emotions don't die. They get buried alive, and they're going to pop up at all the wrong times. All it takes is a little stimulation, and out pops whatever it is you never dealt with. Now, all right, poured out. He poured out his heart. The next thing he did was in verse 2, as he declared, I declare my trouble before God. David places his dilemma before God because, again, we said it before, you have to admit it before you can quit it. <laughs> There's people that live in denial. But can you do this today? Can you de declare your trouble before God? Can you place it and present it and give it to him? for safekeeping, <laughs> which really, he takes it away and gives you peace in exchange. David really, he expressed his confidence in God in the midst of all of this, and that's what we need. There's two choices. 
David had two choices. You have two choices in your cave. You can get rid of it and get the supernatural exchange on the inside to where you know you've got peace on the subject, or you can let it ferment, and it will eventually destroy you. A lot of your physical ailments are nothing more than unresolved conflicts in you that you refuse to give to God. Now, we had somebody ask about uh, visualization. Uh, we don't believe in guided imagery visualization where you do it mentally. But like if, if uh, in other words, oh, I see Jesus forgiving my uncle. That ain't that. No, no. You know how you forgive your uncle? Is you see your uncle in your head, perhaps, but down in the gut, that bitterness, it has to be given to Jesus to where it changes to peace. So you, you can't just visualize stuff away. What you visualize has to be presented to God. And you've got to give him those toxic emotions. He, he, you have to present it to him. You can't just theoretically, oh, I, I forgave everybody. I don't need this. This is everybody else needs this. I've forgiven everybody. That's nice in theory, but how about in reality? Remember that lady I forgave everybody? And her husband was sitting next to her. Oh, that was dangerous. And, and he says, well, what about the neighbor when they didn't bring back the shovel? What about, next thing you know, she's manifesting. I wilded on it. Guess what? You didn't forgive everybody. You're living a lie. <laughs> Admit it so you can quit it. All right. Now, those two choices, you can pour it out to God or you can let it ferment. But in the cave, you have to connect intimately with God. Um, you know, God knows, in verse 3, he says, In the cave, God knows my walk. Remember, this is the psalm that he wrote, 142, verse 3, When my spirit was overwhelmed within me. All right. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me. What does that mean? That means I'm not sure of my next step. Have you ever been there? I don't know what path I'm to walk in. <laughs> Have you ever been there? I don't understand what's going on. Have you ever been there? <laughs> I can't see beyond where I'm at right now. I love Jesus, but I'm in the cave and I can't see what to do. And, oh, here's the best part. This is for all the head people. I haven't been able to figure it out. <laughs> Some people live by that. You're not that smart, all right? God's smarter than you, and the reasoning mind has gotten more people in trouble than it's worth. David can't see beyond where he's at, and he can't figure out which way to go. And the beauty of it is, what's it say in Proverbs? We teach this in all of the modules. Acknowledge him through divine intimate connection, and he will direct your path. Not you figuring it out. You'll have the unction, the anointing, the initiative that comes from the Spirit of God saying, do this, don't do that. Go here, don't go there. All right? Have you ever been where David was? Couldn't figure out what was going on, what you were doing? Couldn't understand why? Oh, gee. You ever run into that one? I know you've never done this here in Kingdom Life Church, but why? Why did God? Why did God? Let... You won't get anywhere with that one. Mm -mm, nah. Why? Why did God? If God, why did God? You know, yeah, that's not going to work. You couldn't see the invisible plan that God had for you. So how do you, how do you find rest when you don't have all the answers? <laughs> how do you find rest? You don't have all the answers. So you're being turmoil, troubled. What do you do? Well, the fact is, David, in the midst of all of that overwhelming, being overwhelmed, being emotionally uh, overwhelmed, he still had a confidence in God. If you zero in at this, in fact, is my only solution. I'm not looking for a plan B in case God don't come through so I can do it my way. That doesn't work either. David realized, just because he can't see, God's not blind. <laughs> what a revelation. 
Just because you can't figure it out, you don't know why, and you can't see what's going on, God is not blind. Let Acknowledge him, and he'll direct the path. Right? Let him be a lamp unto your feet, as the scripture says, right? All right? But you knew my path, Lord, David said. That's good. That's a good start. Because then he says, the, the Lord is not withdrawn. He's not at a distance. Distance is a deception that's very common to believers. They think God's far, far away, and he's far removed from my scenario. No, it's a question of whether or not uh, you really want that closeness, and you want his answer and not yours. The Lord's observing with undivided attention. His thoughts are continually toward you. They're more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea. You are being scrutinized. Oh, some people don't like that part. You're being scrutinized. But the eyes run to and fro, looking to those that would please him, that would honor him, that would have, walk in the fear of the Lord. It's not a scrutiny like he's going to smack you with a stick. It's a scrutiny that he loves you so much. He's watching all over you. He's watching your decisions. He wants to give you that undivided attention to let you know that he's there. He is considering your steps. Every step. The Lord is still in control of the turns, the yields, the delays, the stop signs. Tim Allen from England sent us a, a, a big picture of, remember we were talking about we have the yield sign? They have the... Um, Give way, give way sign. So whatever it takes, give way, yield, whatever it is, do it. <laughs> okay, Surrender is almost a lost word in the kingdom of God, and yet it was one of the hallmarks of true spirituality. Yield, surrender, let go, let God. Now, in Adullam, David thought he was alone, but God did two things, and I believe he's doing this right now. Pay attention, because these are lessons you're to learn from the cave. What the, one of the first things he did was he sent him his family and friends. Isn't that interesting? Now, he may have been running from his enemies, but it's not good to be alone. In the solitary, even David would get goofy. All right? You could only handle that for a short season. What is that, Proverbs 18.1? The person who isolates themselves. Now, in these cases, he didn't have a choice. He didn't say, I think I'm going to go isolate myself, all right? So there are plenty of people in a cave that didn't choose it that way. But not, nevertheless, there are some that choose it that way. And it says, God sent him encouragers, his family, friends, and they came to him. And what's beautiful is that I noticed that even in a restoration process, whether it's a leader that had fell and got back into uh, restored, even in that restoration, they need something to do. Maybe not thrown into leadership, but they need something to do. And, you know, teach, sing in the choir, I don't know. But what, what something to do is very helpful. So God sent him those who needed encouragement. 400 went to David in the cave of Adullam. So David... God provided him encouragement, but comfort others with the same comfort whereby you've been comforted. You're supposed to then reciprocate. It's not all about just getting it for you. God in his goodness knew what David needed, but God also, David knew enough from God to know relationally, I need to do likewise. He was a natural leader. And this is what we're building. We have a church full of leaders. And it's got to be true because Jennifer just nodded her head. <laughs> it, it is true but there's people that need what you've already gotten and I, the ones that used to thrill us the most when we traveled was well I just had a meeting with Dennis and Jennifer and I learned this this and this and this is how I'm dealing with my stuff I haven't arrived yet but what I've learned I want to tell you uh, those are the people that are going to go somewhere such as I've learned I'm going to help you. And I haven't arrived yet. I've only known a little bit. But you know what? Use what you have and you get more. Troubleshooting 
and helping Christians to heal the brokenhearted, you have to first of all be healed yourself, but then you need to be able to know how to help someone else heal the brokenhearted. And you will learn in ministering to people, like the first time I had, uh, I was a baby Christian and somebody came to me and mental health sent him to me. He was a Christian friend of mine who worked at mental health. And he says, this guy thinks he's Elijah and God talks to him whenever there's thunder. Okay. And he's sitting in front of me, one-on-one -on -one in my house. Now my boys were raised with their dad counseling misfits, loser, <laughs> semi-insane, whatever, I don't know. But he goes, I'm going, oh, God, help. I want to help this man, but I don't have nothing to be. Mental health didn't know what to do. That's a sign right there. They sent him. Uh, and I said, you believe you're Elijah? Hmm. He goes, yes, when God talks to me through the thunder. And I says, did you, did you study all the big names in the Bible? Yes, I know my Bible. Did you notice that all of them, except for Jesus, made mistakes? Hmm, yeah. And that meant at some point in time they were wrong. Mm -hmm. I said, do you think you could be wrong? Maybe your identity is much, much different than Elijah. You don't want to die a copy. You want to be an original made by God. Do you think you could be wrong? Well, I didn't like that, and he hummed and hawed for quite a while. And then he went, okay, I could be wrong. And all I know is the next report I got from mental health is that he's making rapid progress. So guess what? You might be wrong about your self-evaluation and what you think others are thinking and what you think. Uh, that person on the cell phone, I know they're talking about me. Okay, that kind of stuff has to go. <laughs> You have to start communicating with people instead of figuring out what's going on. The most damaged people that I've ever met in the church were people who did not communicate. They figured out what was going on. You do that, and that's dangerous. That's the devil's territory. He'll give you scenarios that are not accurate, and you will be one messed up person. Hmm? How many know what I'm talking about? If you're in the cave and you do that, you better stop it and talk to people like they're human beings. You talk to people as people. You communicate. You learn their differences. You don't have to agree with everything, but you need to learn. But to sit back and analyze, the worst call it discernment, because discernment has built-in redemptive love in it. A lot of what they call discernment, you're just judging, and you came up with, you filled in the unknown with an opinion. That's dangerous. That's what people do, though. They don't know. There's no communication. They fill the void with an opinion. That's dangerous living. You don't, you're not that smart. There's wisdom that comes from above, and there's wisdom that's demonic, and the demonic wisdom goes in there under the guise for Christians as discernment when it's really nothing more than judging and creating a scenario that you don't know what you're talking about. You have this fact and that fact, and you put together a whole theory. Wisdom is looking for redemption. David knew, I can take these misfits, losers, in debt, in distress, homeless people. Well, that's what they were. David was homeless at this point. Was he not? Yeah. So, in Adullam, David thought he was alone, but God did two things. He sent him encouragers, and he sent him people who needed encouragement. That's what God's doing here at Kingdom Life Church. That's what God should be doing in every Christian's life. Go ye into the world, make disciples, not converts, disciples. And God places them in your jurisdiction, and you should know. You know, in the cave, God will use your cave to touch people if you let him. And it's healthy to get your mind off of you and try to touch people instead of poor me. At some point, that's got to transition. The cave field, it says, I looked on my right hand, beheld there was no one who acknowledged me. In the cave, God feels your infirmities. That's why we've taught this for years. Quit trying to get sympathy from people. You offer your infirmities to God. Jesus walked this earth touched by the feeling of our infirmities. 
He knew what rejection was like. He knew what those things were like, but he didn't sit and grovel in it and want to change everybody around him. He simply knew that he walked in it, and this is what people go through. And if they would present it to me, I would take it away. Only Jesus can take away the pain and the sorrow. Now, in the cave... This is why we give our emotions to God. He alone can remove and replace. And the sad part about it is, you know, I watch people who are afraid to feel. When in reality, for God to take it away, you only have to feel the toxic stuff momentarily to give it away. But you can't just do it in your head. That's where that guided imagery garbage came in. Oh, I see Jesus taking my sin away. Well, yeah, he did. Legally, but vitally, <laughs> you have to be involved in it, not just see it. The, in the prophetic, one of the most damaging things in the prophetic is the seeing without the experiencing. You've got to know the source, the source, the source. Because the imagination can be <coughs> whacked. You've got to know the source. But, you know... All of these plans, you know, David feels like my security's gone, my stability's gone, my safety's gone. You know, you ever felt like that? No man cares for my soul, it says in verse 4. No man cares for my soul. You people need to study Psalm 142 and go real slow. And see where you can identify and say, I think I need to change that because I think like that sometimes too. All right. And remember, I don't know what your cave is. Could be school, could be home, could be neighborhood, you know. But at first, he had no advocate. He had nobody, no anchor, no affection to cheer him up. <laughs> and he felt deserted. I'm sinking. I have no earthly friends. <laughs> What do you do? Did you ever go through a time when uh, you felt like you had no earthly friends? Or the ones that were your friends suddenly abandoned you? Do you remember those? Do you remember that time? David discovered, though, his refuge is the Lord. The Lord is always faithful. His portion is the Lord. <laughs> Presence of God is, will be enough regardless of these ugly circumstances. And David can lean upon God. So what's your cave? I think this is important because this is not just a teaching. These are lessons that have been applied and learned experientially and really. These people in the cave were changed. I, I feel that people that don't change, that have been the same from the time they got saved till now, or worse, backslidden, there's not a legitimate excuse because God was there all along. You had the choice to be bitter or better. That's really the bottom line. It's not that complicated. You had, to, you had a choice. What's your cave? Is, now, here's some, some caves that might be interesting. I thought it was interesting. Uh, even if you all can't relate to this, there's somebody out there that can relate to this. Uh, maybe it's caring for an aging parent. Someone could feel like they're in a cave. I have an aging parent, and my life has radically changed now all of a sudden. I'm in poor health. That leaves me with pain. Well, I know I sympathize with people in chronic pain. I've had it, been there, done that. And it's, it's like it will affect, if you let it, everything around you. The only thing that God told me, I got healed after three years of sciatic pain that was so bad when I was in my 30s. I was going to quit ministry, and I told God, I guess I have to quit ministry because people talk to me. I can't hear what they're saying. The pain is that loud. And you know what God told me to do? He just says, don't get irritated. Don't get angry. That was my challenge. Well, I, I want it healed. And he's telling me don't get angry or irritated. And I started ministering to people, and I refused to allow that anger. And this is 20, too many years ago. We're not going to get to go there at my age. 
how many years ago, but it was a long time ago, three years to where I was convinced I, I couldn't pastor anymore. And then suddenly I knew that I knew that I was not getting irritated or angry. I was not playing the blame game, which will take you down every time because Jesus is the one that took care of the blame game if you're born again, truly. And all of a sudden, after three years, this is not instant, three years, God says, I'm going to heal you. And there was a knock on my office door, and it was a nurse that was in my church. She opened the door, and right before she opened the door, and God said, I'm going to heal you, I saw what looked like a piece of popcorn, like a top view. She knocked on my door, opened the door, and she opened up one of her medical books to the whatever that is down there, C4, C5, whatever, I don't know what it is, lower back. And it was an aerial view, exactly what I saw in the spirit. And she healed, and it was healed from that time forward to this day. So I don't know what your cave is, but it could be health, pain, separation or death of a loved one. That could be a real cave, couldn't it? Huh? A memory from a lost child. Oh, we just heard that terrible story of that little two-year-old that drowned. Oh, just, you know, it just breaks your heart. Pain or abuse by people you trusted. Mistreatment at the hands of someone. Unexpected betrayal, injustice, or, re or rejection. I, I don't know what your cave is, but those are caves for people. And they still have a choice. God didn't go anywhere. David found out. Attend to my cry, verse 6. Deliver me from my persecutors. Hear me, O God. Heal my soul is what he's saying. Sanctify. He, he's moving toward a sanctifi sanctifying work in himself. Heal my soul. I know there's trouble with me. I'm giving it to you so that you can heal my soul. You alone are the only one that can take away my overwhelming negative emotions of pain and sorrow. There's power in prayer. There's power in travail. There's power in intercession. And God still delivers even to this day. Deliver me, for they are stronger than you. He says in verse 6, Deliver me, for they are stronger. Have you ever felt something is strong? I don't know. It could be drugs. Something is stronger than you. It doesn't take much to be stronger than you. Really. In everybody's life, there's something that's stronger than you. Now, is there some sin in your life today that feels so strong that it's overpowering you? Is there a prison that you're in that you need to get out? <laughs> Verse 6, really crying out to me. How about you? Because faith still works. David opened with crying, but he ends with singing. And if you read the Psalms, I think Jennifer covered that when she taught on the Psalms. It's beautiful. He might start out with the problem, but he ends up with the redemptive solution. That should be our life, too. He opens with crying, ends up with singing. Opens with prayer, ends up with praise. <laughs> Opens with despair, but ends up with delight. Jesus, didn't that sound like Jesus? I delight to do thy will, O Lord. There's people in the crossroads of deciding whether or not they want to do the will of God. <laughs> Remember, none of this chastening feels good at the time, but that transparency and that intimacy is absolutely necessary, and it's got to be real. Now remember, it was after the cave of Adullam. Ah, we're out. All right, let's look at it. what it was like on the other side. David became king over Judah. Defeated the Philistines, conquered the Moabites. David built an empire for Solomon, his son. David organized cities of refuge. Oh, David brought the ark back to Jerusalem. David set up the tabernacle of David, wrote psalms and organized tabernacle music. Woo! Why all of this? Because David sought the Lord 
and he passed through the cave of Adullam. He didn't stay there. But how did he do it? He did it without bitterness. Listen to me, listen to me. Here's the here. You want to harbor some kind of ill will on the inside of you? It's only going to ferment and destroy you. You're only going to look to other people's actions towards you when in reality God says, what about your response from them? How did you respond to them? I'm not interested in what they did. I'm interested. Remember when Jennifer in her first marriage, her husband wasn't saved. He was abusive. And he used to say things like, you know, you go get religion on me and I'll divorce you. And, and he, would, uh, he would antagonize her, verbally abusive. And then Jennifer thought she was going to cry out to God. So she said, God, look what he's doing now. Look at what he just did there. Look at that. Look at this. Look at that. Look at that. And God gave her that scripture. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace. Quit pointing the finger of what somebody else is doing, and you deal with your own heart. Are you going to get out of that cave? The pointing of the finger doesn't work in the cave. So how about you? You want God to deal bountifully with you? Then remember, David... His accomplishments were on the other side of the cave because David sought the Lord. All right. Now here's something <clears throat> that. Um, and what was the secret? Without bitterness, that's got to stay and be dealt with before you move. But here's a, a, a little. I used to memorize a J A D A because God showed me a pattern that was necessary even in discipleship because some people would not they want to I'll take whatever you give me but I'm never going to do it for anybody else all right I I receive but I'm not going to give it out and here was the four things that God said every believer needs to know if you're going to get out of that cave jada j a d a was the way I always memorized it over the years here's a sequential order of understanding jurisdiction this is true. Pay attention. Because remember those people that went, even the losers and the homeless, they went to the cave. They did something. You know what they did? They, they in their desperation, they want to know, where do, I, where do I belong? And they went to David and made him a captain over them. But listen, Acts 17, 26, jurisdiction. And he has made from one, meaning God, from one blood, every nation of men to dwell under the face of the earth. And he has determined the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their living. He appointed the exact place in which you should live. You need to be in the right place. Secondly, adjudicate. There has to be that internal transformation that if you're in the right place, you still need to change. You need to be allowing God to rule. I told you, God showed me that years ago, I used to feel like my will, I was willful, that it was like a handlebar, that I was doing it my way. I'm not sure what God wants, but I'm doing it my way. And God said, if you would give me that bar, I will wrap my strength around it, and then I will put it in your hand as a scepter of authority. But whose authority was it? His. So your will can either be struggling against God or it can become a scepter of authority and you adjudicate. So there's jurisdiction, adjudication. To adjudicate means to rule in authority. <clears throat> and the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The third element, <clears throat> and this is something I want intercessors to hear and people involved in the spiritual warfare. Uh, I've seen people involved in spiritual warfare that never won the battle within, but they were trying to attack principalities and powers and deal with the supernatural realm. All right, win the battle within, <laughs> and it's both. We need to approach the prayers in the heavenlies, but you also need to know that the strongholds that need to be brought down need to be up here first. You've got thoughts that are held captive and until they're brought captive to the obedience of Christ, you're an accident going somewhere to happen. So displacement is the third element. You know, the 
kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. But the fear of the Lord initiative that we've been talking about lately requires effort and dedication. By reason of use, having your senses exercised, you displace the enemy. So the cave didn't change. The people in the cave changed. There was displacement. They looked to God as the light in the midst of their darkness, and the displacement was required. Now, the fourth element, A, advancement. That has to do with learning to contend in the spirit and contending so that well, let's, let's read Judges 3. These are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generation <clears throat> of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. God was going to teach you how to successfully wage war. That in this world, there's going to be tribulation. You better know how to deal with it. You can't be some kind of a pacifist that doesn't believe in anything. <laughs> you just think, I can just put my head in the sand and ignore it all. Spiritual warfare is an absolute necessity. But also, it's cleaning up and winning the battle within, too. We need both. So, uh, whether it's the homeless... The mighty warriors. <laughs> but I'm looking at this last one. I taught this years ago as uh, sons of tenacity. The sons of tenacity. These were David's mighty men. They were no longer homeless. They became mighty warriors. But they were diligent. There's a key word there, diligence. You know, it's not a casual walk in the park. You will seek me and find me when you... Search for me with all your heart. There's effort and dedication to that effort. Lazy Christians don't ever accomplish much. And remember we were talking about the seven deadly sins and somebody calculated that women's sins are a little bit different category than men's. Men's were lazy and lustful and angry. And women, we didn't, I don't have them memorized, but women were um, gluttonous jealous and I don't remember the third one but they're all sin so we deal with it but it's interesting that women sin a little bit different than the men do yeah the Hallmark movies where uh, are not true solutions by the way I want to minister to everyone but somehow they figure it out in the last four minutes. That's not real reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see too many men do that. When, you're, when your uh, relationship is suffering, I don't see men eating a gallon of ice cream. Right? That could be a woman thing. Don't email me. All right. Well, let, let me conclude with this. All right, The enemy's tactic is to wear out the saints of the Most High God, and he's not going to get away with it. But they that know their God will be strong and do exploits. The pattern is God's assigns a place. There's a cave of Adullam for everybody at some point. It will attract people to that place. It will transform the distress and weariness to strength, and it equips a crowd to become an army. It prepares a bride to know God. It grows a family to become a unified household, and it equips an army to advance the cause of the kingdom of God, to advance the rule of the conquering king. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.